these infantry charges were horrendous. The, the slaughter, the um, conditions, the, the outcomes, etc. You've got to you've got to wonder and marvel at these men who kept charging. It's something you can't quite <laughs> can't quite get your head around sometimes. If in doubt, fix bayonets and charge the enemy. The old-fashioned bayonet charge won many battles for the British during the Napoleonic era. But was there still a place for it in later wars? Today is the third instalment of my series examining the life of General Sir Hugh Gough, one of the greats of British military history. Once again, historian Chris Bryce joins me on the show and explains Gough's performance as Commander-in-Chief during the First Anglo-Sikh War of 1845-1846. Could he perform at the highest levels against a brave and well-equipped foe? We'll find out today. For more background on the Anglo Sikh Wars, you might want to check out my interviews with Amapol Singh. He's brilliant, actually. I really enjoyed those interviews. I'll link to them in the show notes below, but you can just find them by searching on my page. There's also a longer, more in-depth version of this interview on my podcast, the Redcoat History Podcast, that can be found on most podcasting apps, so do check that out if you want a little bit more information. I try and keep things as short as I can on YouTube. To try and sum up this conflict in a couple of sentences, War with the Sikhs came about after the death of the great Ranjit Singh, the ruler of the Sikh kingdom. After his death, there was a power vacuum and the British and East India Company began to increase their forces close to the border. With both sides wary of the other, it was only a matter of time before war would be declared. Sir Hugh Gough, the subject of our film today, was at the time Commander-in-Chief of the Bengal Army. That put him in command of the British and East India Company forces. The first battle of the war was fought at Mudki on the 18th of December 1845. It was a messy British victory. Shortly afterwards was the brutal fight at Ferozshah, where Gough's army came within a whisper, a whisker even, of being beaten. There were other battles that you will hear about today, including Sir Browen, which saw the final defeat of the Sikhs on the 10th of February 1846. Chris began today's chat by explaining how Gough was in the unenviable position of having his civilian boss, Lord Hardinge, who you might remember from some of my Peninsular War episodes, he was at Albuera for example, was also serving as his military second in command. How awkward is that? Let's hear more. If Hardinger had come along and said, right, I'll take over the staff duties, which he was more than capable to do and had the experience of that, that would have been the great help to go. There's a wonderful quote by uh, Professor Sir Hugh Strawn about Goff, where he says he, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, but he, he says he's a, he's a blucher who never found his Neisner. So he never found that chief of staff who would get him into the position where he could fix bandits in charge, in effect, or, or fight the battle. He never found that man to, to be that organiser for him. And I think that's a very fair comment. And I think it's, it's that. If that's where Hardinge could have, he could have been the, the Neisner. And he could have really helped, uh, you know, make things run fast more smoothly. But of course, later on in the conflict, we get that rather unpleasant incident where the second in command overrules the commander in chief. This is at the Battle of Pharaoh's Shah, is that right? Yes, yeah. Um, where he takes on his his role as governor general and basically says. You know, I'm not going to let you fight the battle. You're going to wait. Um, so for any listeners who aren't aware, I think Goff just wanted to throw his men at the Sikh defences, didn't, didn't he? And yeah. Hardinge said, no, you need to wait till you've got more men. Is that essentially what happened? That's essentially it. Um, the problem is it just takes too long. And then you have a position where do they wait? Because he doesn't attack till the afternoon. You have a problem there. Does he attack then, or does he wait until the following day? He decides, part, again, partly under pressure from Hardinge, to attack that afternoon. Rather than just simply think that it's a gung-ho attitude of, um, of, of Goffs, and obviously there was an element of that, that he wasn't much a uh, fixed Bennett's and charge man. Um, there is also, that is the considered tactic 
for dealing with troops in India, for dealing with native forces in India. And this goes back to the French experience, this is before the, the British, that you go on the offensive, you attack. You don't sit back and defend, you attack. That's yeah, the way... Clive of the, India, wasn't it? It goes all the way back to Clive. That was his kind yeah. of mantra. Well, yeah, and I think actually, uh, the, yeah, I mean, Clive's the first sort of um, British commander to use it, but it actually goes back to the French experience. And it's been that sort of tactical doctrine throughout that period ever since that you know if you're facing a native army you attack you don't sit on the defensive you attack that's the best way to deal with this situation that's in a sense all goff's doing the fact that it's also you know his main tactic as well um and again this goes back to our previous interview this is a man who has seen the uh french army that has conquered europe beaten back by british infantry uh, time and time again. And I've been asked this question a number of times, you know, did Goff underestimate the Sikhs? And I don't believe he did. If you read his quotes, uh, if you read his letters and correspondence, he knows he's facing a very tough enemy. Uh, he knows that they're incredibly capable. I don't think he ever underestimates the Sikh. I think, if anything, he overestimates uh, his own forces. Uh, he overestimates what British infantry can do in, the, in, the, in these circumstances. Um, but I mean, that does take us to an interesting area. You know, the Sikhs are a hugely impressive military force. Yes, this isn't the army of, of Ranjit Singh. This isn't that sort of, you know, level of sophistication, really. But we're talking about an army that has been trained and disciplined, most of it, by experienced Napoleonic officers. You have a number of former uh, generals, etc., from Napoleon's army, who have come over to uh, the Sikh Empire under Ranjit Singh, and they start developing. So you've got one commanding the artillery, one you know training up the infantry, the cavalry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One commanding sort of like a logistical area. And, and this is developing a, a very sophisticated, modern-looking army in many respects. Their firearms and their technology is at least equal to the British in many respects. Um, they have their own gun foundries. There's a Sikh um, gun engineer whose name, I'm, I'm afraid, escapes me, but he's one of the best of his age. And he's not only... I mean, originally they start off copying European patterns, but then they start developing their own and improving them. And there are, there are times in the Anglo Sikh Wars, which is something that no one really wants to admit during the conflicts or immediately after them, where British artillery is outclassed. It really is. And we're not just talking about um, the guns themselves. We're talking about the gunners as well. Sikh gunners are excellent during the conflict. Um, and we have this excellent military machine which is far more um, difficult for Goff to defeat than I think a lot of people appreciate. There's a quote from the Duke of Wellington just during this period that said, uh, you know, people in Britain had forgotten that Indians could fight because there's been such such relatively easy victories up to that point. But well, we were coming up against an army here that was a, a serious, serious threat. Um, I'm sure you've spoken with uh, Amapal and Gurinder about the levels of betrayal um, yeah. amongst Sikh generals. A lot of internal strife, not a happy court. No, and we know very clearly that uh, some of the senior Sikh generals are during the conflict itself in correspondence with senior political officers within the British Army, but also the Governor General. Um, there is one important uh, element to understand with that. Um, I've not seen anything in any of the correspondence to suggest that Goff is actually aware of this. I think he's given some of the information, obviously, through channels, but none of the correspondence is directly with Goff. So I'm I'm unsure how much he ever really knew about that 
that side of things. Um, again, you know, yes, obviously, there's an element in which the senior Sikh leadership are hedging their bets. Um, they're not entirely, they, they actually don't want the Sikh army to win to some extent because of how that will affect them personally. Um, there's an element of that, but that only goes so far. Uh, I don't think you can say that's the only reason why there's there's a British success, etc. Um, I think you've got to look at, at, at more in, in more depth than, than that. I mean, yes, that plays a part, but I mean, uh, we, we mentioned briefly uh, Faroz Shah, where on the second day of the battle, um, you may know the story. Uh, as well as I do, that um, the British are short of ammunition, short of men. They're stood ready facing the enemy, waiting for the Sikh attack. Um, things look pretty black. But again, we're talking about British infantry in, in def on defence here, um, which I don't think should be underestimated. Um, I don't think, as many people think, oh, if, if the uh, if the Sikh army had just charged the British that day, they'd have won the, the battle. I think that's mm. I think that's a little unfair. Um, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened. I'm just saying I don't think it would have been an easy victory by any stretch of the imagination. No, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, British infantry, particularly in defence, are very tenacious. E even without ammunition. <laughs> um, I mean, let's remember at, uh, at Waterloo, by the end of that, they're down to, what, a few rounds per man? Uh, it's a very s small number of am amounts of ammunition that's left. Uh, similar, in a sense, to uh, Faroz Shah. And, of course, we get this bizarre incident at Faroz Shah where there's a young staff officer called Lumley, um, who actually is, is one of the, uh, the ancestors of jo Joanna Lumley. But, oh, OK, uh, British actress. Yes, and as as you know, she's um, she's spoken quite strongly about her military links and her links to British India over the years. This this is one side of the family she doesn't mention too often, because this young lieutenant, who I think if we're being polite, had got a touch of the sun, um, had the night before tried to order part of the army to leave, but he sent the he he given the order to Harry Smith. And Harry Smith is one of those great characters, you know, you, you probably know a fair bit about him in, in South Africa, um, who, who wasn't going to take orders from some jumped up little lieutenant. Uh, if he was going to take orders, he was going to take it from the commander in chief. And so he didn't do it. But then on the day of the, on the second day of the battle, Lumley tells all the cavalry and artillery to leave the field and they do it. And so you have this bizarre situation where at the start of the conflict, the infantry is there waiting. <clears throat> and suddenly all the artillery <laughs> and, and cavalry start moving away from the field of battle because they're being given these orders by this Lieutenant Lumley, uh, who, who is a staff officer. And you can understand commanders thinking, well, this must come from the commander in chief then. Now, there is a point at which I will give some fair uh, legitimacy to the seat decision not to press the attack then. But if you suddenly see a load of artillery and cavalry moving off to your flank, I can understand quite legitimately thinking, what's going on here? What are they trying to do? Now, the Sikh commanders do know that there is a lot of British infantry, um, still about 10,000 men, I believe, uh, at, um, at another base, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, is it Fer Ferozpur, I think? It might Just be, yeah. Uh... Yeah, Ferozpur. Um, and I think it's perfectly understandable if a Sikh commander thinks, wait a minute, are they coming, are the artillery and infantry going over there to join up with some infantry that might be coming that I don't know about uh, to attack me in the flank whilst I'm going forward to attack the British? Now, you know, there's the duplicity, there's the connivance, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think there is a legitimate case to be made for saying, do you know what? We'll leave the field. We'll fight this another day. I think you can make a legitimate case for that. I really do. Yeah. Um, and partly because of the the idiotic behaviour of this this Lieutenant Lumley, 
I, I think you can perhaps make a case for that. Um, I, just, needless to say, I don't think he saw any further service. <laughs> <laughs> So we've we spoke about Ferroz Shah and at Ferroz Shah, Goff did, you know, launch a, a, a bayonet charge essentially against the Dugin Sikh positions. And I believe he did something similar at Sabrawan. What what do yes. you think, having researched him and read a lot about him, do you think this was a good idea? I know he's been criticised for it, but essentially he didn't lose those battles and at Sabrawan had a great victory. So was he actually right to throw his men forward in these sorts of bayonet charges against dug-in positions? It, it, it's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, obviously, as we've established, he's a great believer in the strength of British infantry in the bear. He's not alone in that uh, doctrine by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, in many ways, military tactics of this period were all designed to bring you to a point where you could do just that. You could unleash the infantry with the bayonet. Um, that's the way battles are fought during this period still. So in one sense, that's, you know, that's entirely understandable. I suppose there's something a bit more to look at, as I mentioned previously, the strength of the Sikh army. Normally, you would launch your artillery, as uh, launch your infantry after your artillery had silenced, you know, the, the enemy guns. I mean, this is a simplistic way of, of describing battle tactics during this period, but doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. Uh, it normally starts off with an artillery duel. You know, the, the, the artillery fire at each other trying to gain the upper hand. Um, if one does, then normally that's the force that launches the infantry forward with bayonets at the, at the front. Now, part of the problem, as I explained, Sikh artillery is that good. The British very rarely, if ever, outclass the, the, the artillery they're facing. Um, I mean, there is obviously at, um, at Mudki, uh, Goff does miss a trick because uh, the artillery duel to begin with is, is, is a stalemate. But then the cavalry, the British cavalry do wonderful work at Mudki. They drive away some of the uh, Sikh cavalry and they also drive away some of the gunners and they silence the artillery. Now, at that point, really, a more astute commander than Goff might have restarted his artillery bombardment, but this time straight at the, um, at the Sikh infantry and cavalry that remained on the field. Uh, he doesn't. The fading light does play a fact in that, but he could still probably should have done it. Um, Ferroz Shah, again, he hasn't got the upper hand in terms of artil the artillery duel. So what do you do? Well, to a man like Goff, it's quite simple. You fix bayonets in charge. Um, is that the best tactic to do? Possibly not. Is it the worst tactic to do? Again, probably not. Um, but I suppose you can't really condemn a man too much for playing to his strengths, which, and he perceived that to be his strength. Now, if you ever actually think about it, these infantry charges were horrendous. Um, the, the slaughter, the, um, the, you know, the, the con conditions, the, the outcomes, etc. cetera. Um, You've got to you've got to wonder and marvel at these men who kept charging. Um, it, it's 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 something you can't quite <laughs> can't quite get your head around sometimes um, that they would keep going and keep going and keep going. Uh, it, it is absolutely remarkable. Um, so, in that sense, I suppose that sort of gives a bit of a strength to. Goff's thought of on launching the infantry, because you see this force going again and again and again. You know, you can understand if you've got infantry that that is that disciplined, for want of a better word, I can't think of a better word, that discipline, you can understand wanting to unleash them on the enemy. Um, was it the right decision? Not necessarily. But, you know, I'm not entirely sure, uh, through Raza Shah, what exactly he could have done differently. Um, and again, 
he's been greatly delayed by uh, by Hardinge. The light's fading him, fading. Uh, he's he's running out of time. A more prudent man might have waited until the following day. Uh, Goff wasn't that sort of person. You know, he wanted to attack the enemy. And again, as we say, that is the principle of warfare in India. Go on the offensive. Um, but it's it, it's difficult. You know, it's it's a difficult situation. It's very easy to say. You know, hundred and. 70 years later or whatever it is um, and say oh it was wrong or it wasn't the right decision you know etc but really at that time and that place I think it's an understandable decision yeah and and I mean essentially you know whatever however he may be criticized you know and whatever was happening behind the scenes with the Sikh forces that war was a victory. And so I guess from that sense, you can't take that away from him. Now, after the British victory, I haven't read much about the second Sikh war, but what do we what do we see happen? He is still in charge then, isn't he? Sorry for a dumb he question. Is, yes, yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you do, you do get a bizarre situation where, uh, and, and you sort of alluded it, to it there, that, um, you know, we, we get Prozshar, then we get... Um, uh, Harry Smith's victory at uh, Aliwal, um, which actually, if you look at some of the correspondence, Goff gets a lot of credit for, for giving uh, Smith the means and the opportunity to go and, uh, and do it. You know, because in a sense, Goff is, has been, again, by political authorities, has been limited as to what he's allowed to do at this stage. He's, he's being told to wait for reinforcements, but he doesn't want to be completely inactive. So he sends Harry Smith off with a decent force. Now, Harry Smith, uh, probably a more astute commander than Goff in some ways. He is very fortunate at Aliwal in that the, the Sikhs make a fatal mistake and that they place themselves with their back against the river. And therefore, what starts as a, as a setback becomes a rout because they've no way to escape, really. Um, and then the final battle again, which you know just shows how hard the Sikhs fought at Sabran. Um, we we see just how strong and determined an enemy it is. Goff doesn't do too much wrong at Sabran, to be perfectly honest. Um, yes, perhaps he could have done some things better. But who couldn't? Um, but he's still, you know, and it's a victory, but still quite high casualties. And you have to give the credit to the Sikhs. You know, it, it, this is part of the problem I have with the criticism of Goff, because some of it's understandable. A lot of it, though, I think it's more we look back as historians and we just underestimate the Sikhs. We look at, back at them and we don't quite appreciate how formidable a force this was. Um, and you can talk about their leadership and their you know, duplicity, et cetera, et cetera. But during a battle, when you're there in your battalion or you're there in your, on your guns, Sikh soldier, that doesn't matter. You know, that they're fighting who's in front of them at that time. They're not necessarily bothered about who's behind them. So there's this determination from the individual soldiers, even if there isn't from the leadership. So when you're in battle, don't underestimate the Sikh army because they are formidable. True. And so, you know, we, that's the end of the first Anglo-Sikh war. Um, a compromise is arranged where there is still a Sikh state, but there are British sort of control, etc. It, it's a bit of a nothing situation. They didn't annex the Punjab, which perhaps they, they should have done then if they were going to do it at all. Um, and it just meant that the second conflict was, was inevitable. And so the first Sikh war was won, but those brave infantry charges certainly cost the British and East India Company forces a lot of casualties. With the second Sikh war only a few short years away, be sure to subscribe and hear what happened and how Sir Hugh Goff fared in that later conflict. Like, subscribe and comment because we will be marching back into battle soon. Alright guys, take care.